Remember those walls that we caught sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But he came and he died and he rose Those walls are rubble now death and grave They were like mountains that stood in our way But he came and he died and he rose Those giants are dead now This is our God This is who he is He loves us This is our God This is what he does He saves us He bore the cross Beat the grave Let heaven and earth proclaim This is our God King Jesus Remember that fear That took our breath away Faith so weak That we could joined us and I do want to say a special thanks to uh, Penny, Steph, the whole crew that was in there that made breakfast happen. We uh, are excited to gather together. Today is a celebration day, and this morning we will start by singing the praises of the Lord. If you're able, will you stand with us as we worship? Could I get a little bit of sound on the piano, please? <laughs> Maybe. No? That's cool. You want to move to the real one? Hold on one moment, please. <laughs> okay. One, two, three, four.
Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. The world that he gave us is one and only son to save us. For God so loved the world that he gave us is one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated now is. I walk in in freedom for God so loved, God so loved the world. She's Okay. 
can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know. And life is worth the living just because he lives. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Would you please join me in prayer? Father, we come before you today full of gratitude and joy because today we get to celebrate your victory that we get to share in. Lord, we thank you for what you've done and that you give us the gift of salvation. I pray that every person in here knows that you died and rose for them and that they can partake in your kingdom because of that. Be with us, help us feel your presence this morning. Be with Pastor Chrissy as she gives us the word and help us leave here ready to share your love. In your name, amen. And now I'll invite you to a couple minutes of greeting those around you, and then we'll do some announcements. That's alone. One, two, three, four. Good morning, church family. Oh, my goodness. I was warned it might take us a couple of extra minutes to settle down this morning. You don't have minutes. You have seconds. So, uh, happy Easter. Happy Easter. Uh, it's time for... Uh, I love you people. I have you so well trained. But it's actually time for offering. So if I could have the ushers come forward, we'll pray. 
Um, this, this offering, this uh, passing of the plate expression, that's one way that you can bring an offering to the Lord this morning. You can also hit the QR code on the back of your program, and that'll take you to, what, text to give, or does it take you to the app? It will take you to the uh, website. It takes you to the website. There you go. And um, the text to give, pretty cool thing. I tried that out last week. If you know, if anybody was paying attention, there was an offering for a dollar. That was me just testing it out to see if it worked, and it did work. So um, I did the text to give that time. Um, but anyway, so lots of opportunities to be faithful to the Lord in our giving and bringing back. So if you would join me in prayer while we, pr I, I was delaying as long as I could, Steve. I got you there. Good. Um, <laughs> just uh, we'll pray, and then we'll take offering, and then we'll do announcements. Father God, thank you for this morning, and it is, it, it is so humbling to be here. It's humbling to be here amongst your people on this Resurrection Sunday, and it's with that spirit of humility, Lord, that we bring our offering, knowing that we're not worthy, knowing that this offering is not worthy, but knowing that we serve a faithful God, full of blessings. So Father, we just pray that you would receive this offering, that you would bless it and our time together today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, two announcements. Finally, the much, uh, uh, the much uh, uh, awaited. No, I, I can't use that term for announcements. That's kind of lame. But wave your... The much anticipated. Good. I'll take that from the shears because I have to. A um, couple of things to talk about this morning. Uh, wait, I want to try to get them in order and I'm going to be bad about it. Today, today I in your bulletin, there's an announcement about Aspire Women's event. Okay, number one, this event is sold out. So there's now a uh, limited opportunity. Today is the day. Ladies, if you want to go to this event, today is the day that you have to talk to Debbie Midkiff after church today. It is your final opportunity to take advantage of what I know will be a really tremendous event. So if you're interested in that Aspire Women's event, today is the day you have to take action. Uh, looking forward into next weekend. Because after today, I'm tired. I don't know about anybody else, but <laughs> some of us, I got at least one amen out of that. Good. Um, looking into next weekend, next Saturday, Pancakes with Stan. It's not in the bulletin. You can, you can applaud for that. Yeah. Woo. Pancakes with Stan. Yeah. Um, it's not in the bulletin, so if you have a pen or you just see your neighbor with one and you want to steal theirs, write it in to the bulletin because that way you have it with you to remind you that next Saturday morning is Pancakes with Stan. So come out, uh, break some pancakes, they're bread, right? And, and break into the Word and spend that fun time of fellowship next Saturday. And then next Sunday begins our election time. Final reminder, um, this is an important uh, part of the life of our church as we choose those leaders and individuals who will lead the congregation into the next season. Uh, even now, be in prayer about this decision, be in prayer about whose names will appear on that ballot, and really be in prayer about what God would have us do and who we would, he would ch have us choose to lead the congregation. Um, so, that we'll start with voting on the 7th and then we'll finish voting on the 14th. So both of those days you'll have the opportunity. It is for, I want to make sure I get the right language here, members. Voting members must be 15 years of age or older and on the official church membership role. If you are uncertain whether or not you are on the official role, you should check in with Pastor Chrissy because she's the role keeper. <laughs> I don't know if that's really a job. I just made it up. <laughs> but it sounded like it fit. And then the only thing, other thing I want to say is, um, as we are on the precipice of the month of April, the back of your bulletin has upcoming events in the month of April, chapel bells dates, church board meeting, crafting bee, all those fun things going on. <gasps> oh, April 28th, wedding shower for Noah and Amanda. I'm super, yeah. Yeah, yeah, what a great way to end the month of April. I'm sure we'll have more information about it as we get there, but April 28th, mark your calendars. Uh, I think that's it. Gail. Gail is going to come uh, this morning and lead us in the reading of the Word. Good morning. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among him and said to them, 
peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking what they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? Why do you doubt rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is my, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have a flesh and bones as you see I have. When he said to this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they stood and did not believe, it because of joy and amazement, he said to them, do you have anything here to eat? He, they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. He said to them, what is this I told you while I was still with you? Everything must be fulfilled, for it is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead, and the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, Beginning at Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. Thank you, Gail. So, I mean, I feel like now we can go home. That was the story right there, right? We've had breakfast, uh, fellowship, but there's more, actually. Um, we have had a really, really great weekend. Very busy. And busy because there was so much to not just remember and recall, but to celebrate. So Thursday night, we had a Seder dinner here, and um, it was wonderful. Pastor Patrick, thanks for leading us in that. Uh, then Friday, the students and Pastor Tori and some musicians, they did a lot to give us a good Friday space to worship. And so I think Ruben was playing maybe a total of five hours on guitar. So any band-aids thrown his direction, I think his fingers were bleeding by the end, but it happens. And uh, then I do thank everybody who chipped in for breakfast. Of course, this morning is when the ovens don't fully come on. Uh, so we made it work, and Penny, we were all well fed, so thank you for that. Uh, and then uh, we had, it's not sunrise service, it's not Ramada service, it was lobby service uh, a little bit earlier, and we're just going to keep you on your toes. So every year it may be different, but Dennis Kading led uh, the word this morning, and so thank you for that, uh, Dennis. And then uh, we're going to continue and we're going to celebrate because we're going to actually look at the word. And we're going to go to the parts that were the most unbelievable. But I appreciate the, the scripture reading that we did together when it said, the Lord opened their eyes so they could understand. So will you join me? I'm just going to pray that the Lord opens our eyes. Jesus, uh, there is more to you than we could in our um, little selves taken. But Lord, I know that you have a message for us. And so will you open our eyes and our ears? Will you help us and give us understanding to the miraculous uh, gift and power of your resurrection? In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So um, also, I want to thank Ashley. I just realized Ashley put some stuff together for the kiddos. And uh, so that's always very, very helpful on our family Sunday. We're going to go into Luke chapter 24. And again, I feel like although we read passages over and over, there's just there's so many layers to what Jesus does that we're going to look at the account of Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 36, uh, when the message is first given that Jesus is no longer dead and is risen. Luke 24, oops, nope, not in 36. We're, uh, yes, nope, we're going to, yeah, I'm in Luke 24. Luke 24, it's the first verse, sorry. This is where I wanted to go. I think I gave them the wrong one. Uh, verse 1, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. 
They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood before them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces on the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the leaven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying there by themselves. And he went away wondering to himself what had happened. So the ladies head to the tomb and they do something that is normal in the Jewish culture. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, but they bring spices. Um, They're honoring the dead and they know that Jesus was um, not just killed he was beaten and um, his flesh was torn and he died and and some of them actually watched him come off the cross and into the tomb and so the tomb was sealed for many reasons if you aren't aware Jesus was kind of a big deal (laughs) but for some it was big deal in the wrong direction they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah and they wanted to um, shut him up Uh, So they didn't believe and they didn't want Jesus to to tell the truth because it went in contrary to their life. And so they needed him to be gone. And so the Pharisees handed over him to Rome and Rome crucified him. And and now they're in a spot where um, they actually are so um, intent on keeping him in the grave that they cover it. They leave guards there and then they give instructions on he has to stay there. So the ladies go to the place where they've seen him enter in, um, where they know his corpse is there, and he is not. And what they get is a startling revelation from um, angels who are gleaming like lightning. Lightning is pretty bright. So whether they bowed completely out of fear or just because they couldn't look directly at the holiness, they immediately stopped short and um, didn't know what to do. And so the angels actually gave this message and they said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. I want to look at the, that the few passages, a uh, few portions of that passage, and the first one I want to look at is, he is not here. Um, that is a, almost like a little catchphrase for us as believers, but here's the deal. This is very significant. When they said he is not here, what they're talking about is the tomb. He is not in the tomb. And that is very disorientating because that's where he was. And To their credit, the ladies only know that dead things stay dead. Now, we have seen two resurrections, Jairus' daughter. um, We've also seen Lazarus, and Jesus was actually behind those resurrections. But what we will find out later is they're eventually physically going to die. And so this actually is something that's even bigger, and the ladies are taking it in for the first time. And the question um, of why are you looking for the living among the dead is because the tomb is where after you say your goodbyes, that is where your um, loved ones go. Uh, They're no longer with you and you know this. In fact, a few days ago, they saw at the cross and these same ladies witnessed Jesus tell John from the cross this is your mother, and, and Jesus actually gave his mother over to the care of the apostle, of the disciple John. And so they, they see all these things that look like they're ending, um, and, and I need you to take care of my mother from here on out. And so uh, life shifts at the tomb, the dynamics shift. You aren't able to, um, to engage with the person anymore, and, and your structure changes 
So in this shift, they are scared. And in fact, the disciples are all kind of hiding out at this point because they don't know what the Jewish leaders are going to do. If they took Jesus and they killed him, this was our, this was our teacher. This was our friend. This was the one who, who demonstrated all powers and we were certain was the son of God. And so now what about us? But the ladies go to the tomb and the angel says, he is not here. It's not just about a physicality of him not being there. It's the angel saying he is not dead. That this is something that will change all of history because what you think you know about what's in this tomb is wrong. Jesus is not there. The, the tomb is defeat. It's Jesus on the cross. It's the unbeatable being beaten. It's um, so much so that, that there's all sorts of plans. It's in Matthew's gospel where um, after Jesus is, is resurrected and no longer in the tomb, uh, the guards go to the Pharisees and the Pharisees say, okay, here's what we're going to do. That story cannot get out. You're going to say that the disciples came and stole him while you're sleeping. Here's some money. Go spread that story. Because if Jesus is not here in the tomb, that is going to open up a whole bunch of possibilities. And so they do that. The Pharisees in Rome need Jesus to be in that tomb. And the angel says, nope. He's not here. Now that not here is also an opportunity for the story to be continuing. The opportunity of Jesus to still be at work in our world. The opportunity for his physical presence to come back. I used to talk about this in small group studies. Um, you know, you always tend to want to win or I'll say, I always tend to want to win. Uh, and there's this, this idea that when you're in something big, like a political struggle, there's definite high stakes on we will win. And so Rome did all that they could to say we won. Uh, that this guy is not as significant as you think he is. He's causing trouble and we're just going to eliminate him because really we're the big deal. And so they deaded him. That's not a word, but I like it. <laughs> they deaded him because that's the most they could do. And they did it in a public way and they did it in an awful way. And then Jesus didn't stay dead. <laughs> and I think about, you know, I'm not a parent, but as a parent at some point, you've got to go, what else could I do? Uh, I think this was one of the moments for Rome where they said, well, now what? We did all that we could. He was dead. That's how we get things done. And now somebody's telling me he's not there. That's a problem for Rome. And so they, they help initiate these stories of, well, he's just somewhere else. Because here's what's happening is the story actually is getting bigger. Jesus coming to earth, walking with us, um, felt like this huge defeat on the cross. But on day three, he is no longer in the tomb. And where is he? Well, he's out continuing the kingdom. In fact, um, it, he's not only going to walk around, but he's going to be living and walking with us for another 40 days. He's no longer here in the tomb. Death no longer has the hold on him. And he's the only one who could break that. And even then, not all are going to believe. The ladies come back. I do find it funny. I'm wondering if the angels, you know, a little bit of angel sarcasm. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? I don't know if that's really fair, but um, here's why. Because he died. <laughs> I don't know if they realize this, but this, when you put him in the tomb, that's where they stay. And so now they have this, they're able to give the good news to the disciples who were also struggling with what do we do now? And they run back and say, the story is not done. And the disciples are like, yeah, that sounds a little crazy. And again, I don't blame the disciples. That does sound a little crazy, but wait a minute, we watched him raise Lazarus. And so Peter 
he, he shotguns it. The Gospel of John says John's right behind, and he goes out to see what has happened, and he goes into the tomb where he is not, and he finds just the, the wrap that Jesus was in and no Jesus. And it says he, he kind of walked away because he did not believe. Uh, you know what else was happening who did not believe? It's interesting as we watch and we follow Jesus' next steps out of this tomb, we find that it was hard for Mary and the, the women to understand what was going on. And then when they just went ahead and told the disciples, the disciples were like, I'm not sure what you're saying, maybe. And, and the story is breaking open. Thomas is going to yet to believe. Yet to believe? He's going to yet to believe. He's deaded and he's yet to believe. Uh, Mary Magdalene, until Jesus calls her by name, struggles a bit. Two followers on the road to Emmaus are walking with Jesus and their eyes are not open to who he is. Some in the, of the crowd at the Great Commission when Jesus gathers everybody before he sends were like, eh, maybe, and they're looking right at him. That uh, somehow in the midst of Jesus doing stuff, there's going to be doubt. That in the midst of Jesus' kingdom and the story continuing, not everybody is going to get it. But what is Jesus doing? He's continuing the story anyway, because the belief does not affect the power for him to continue to bring in the kingdom. And I started thinking about this. He's not here. He is not dead. That message that they struggled with at first, uh, that, that Jesus was walking among them and they were still having difficulty understanding it. And I'm thinking, you know, in 2024, it may not be that different. That there are some who are trying to keep Jesus in a tomb. That he is not active, he is not alive, and he is not working. And that sometimes within our own walks, we can see and have trouble uh, with doubt because we see so much that is still taking place. Uh, we see death and violence and division. We see self being elevated among commu uh, over community. And, and we think, man, none of that is kingdom stuff. We may even struggle on how we seem to, what the world says, get ahead financially or in status or just emotionally we struggle. And here's what I realize. Um, even when the world tries to tell me that Jesus isn't working or that um, he is either dead or just not active, it doesn't stop Jesus from moving and bringing in his kingdom. That my moments of doubt aren't stopping what he's already doing all throughout the world. That those um, broadcasts of all of the destruction and the way that evil is trying so hard to kill, steal, and destroy does not mean that Jesus isn't coming alongside, even in the midst of war, walking and with people. That his spirit is not living and active. Now, it might get difficult when we're in those seasons, but just hold tight to what the angels said when they claimed he is not here. Death has no hold on him. He has overcome all of it, and he is still at work. So this is interesting because um, Jesus, he isn't defeated because of what I'm experiencing. Jesus doesn't need my belief to bring in his kingdom. He doesn't need... Um, uh, the, the world to fully acknowledge him, although one day they will, uh, because Jesus is still in the process of opening eyes and giving us a mind to see him. Uh, so it's going to continue. Um, you know, the fact is that <sighs> Jesus walking out of that tomb gives us not just the continuation of a story, but the promise and the understanding that there is no threat to his power and his kingdom, that there is nothing on this earth that will keep him from getting to the, the ones that he loves, that will keep him from coming in and saving all of us. So he's, he's coming in strong, he's doing his work, and not everybody is going to catch it. Still, 
Uh, there's more because Jesus is not dead and the kingdom is advancing and it will not be stopped. This juxtaposition of why are you looking for the living among the dead is interesting to me. They said he is not here. Well, that was the last place Mary had seen him, and so it makes sense. But I started thinking about this is where this tomb represents the idea of it's stalled. Death stops things. That if something is dead on Friday and it's still dead on Saturday, it is probably still going to be dead on Tuesday, except for Jesus. That there is no stalling his progress. And so these words, it's interesting, he is not here, he is risen, he is not dead. That, the idea of dead has this like stationary stance, right? There's no I-N-G after dead. Talk about ba bad grammar when I said they deaded him. You don't say, hey, where's Jesus on that holy Saturday? And you never heard him say, well, he's, he's still deading today. He's been deading all day. All day, Jesus has been deading. It's very heartbreaking because he was my friend and we thought big things. That actually death stops and halts things. And, and Mary and the, the ladies, they went to where he, they thought things had been stopped and stalled. Um, that this, this deading is going to continue, except it doesn't. He's actually living. Jesus isn't deading around. Jesus is actually about life and continuous action. So what they're declaring when they say, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Is that there is a continuation and the story is going and the story is about living. That there is an ING after this and he is still doing more. Sometimes I feel like Jesus is not doing anything. That maybe there's a stalemate. And then I remember, wait, He's not here in the tomb. He is living ing. And actually, I mentioned Lazarus and and Jairus's daughter, and they they did experience the resurrection. And the Lord was giving an indication of what is to come that He is about life and life to the full. Jesus is still alive. He never went back into that tomb. And so the I-N-G part goes on and on and on until he accomplishes his mission, which is he's coming after us, that he's, his saving grace and his strength and his power is at work even now. The angels are saying, I know he was supposed to stay in the place like a tomb, but guess what? He didn't, and he's going to keep going and so they're announcing that the faith in the anointed one was right. That their faith in the one who was going to be able to overcome the sin that entraps us, who's going to be able to overcome death and provide an eternal life is actually happening in that moment. And guess what? We celebrate this morning because it is still happening because Jesus is still alive. And I got to tell you, that's a good run. If 2,024 years-ish uh, later, he is still breathing, living, and active. Now, although we don't see him, he says, my spirit is at work. When I physically leave, I will leave you with the spirit. And the spirit is the movement of God still living and active, not in that tomb, but moving forward and advancing his kingdom that his message is going on and he's continuing to shape this new story. Because where we see war, Jesus sees healing. Where we see division, Jesus has the power to reconcile. Where we see hurt and where we see the things that bind us, Jesus has the time to heal and to break open and, and release. And so he is not in the tomb. He is still working. This new story means we're no longer slaves to the sin that entrapped us. That it's only the perfect lamb of God who could suffer death, though undeservingly. And then he took that penalty for us and he broke it by 
raising from the dead. So he walks out of there victorious, not just for himself, but the kingdom that will include us as those adopted to his father. That no longer are we slaves to, at the time it would have been this law that the Pharisees said, in order for you to be righteous, you have to do this, 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 this. Then a little bit of this, 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 this. And Jesus says, it is too heavy a burden for you to bear. I will come and I will fulfill the law. All you need to do is follow me. But Jesus, we're going to mess this up, probably. And I have the power to forgive the sins of many. And so I need you to follow me. Now, side note, this is interesting. All authority is given to Jesus. And so he walks out of that tomb with all authority and now conquering death, conquering the, the worst of the worst. The ladies, when they came, they actually were presuming he was still dead. They bring the spices to him. And in that culture, the spices actually are a way to show even the dead have dignity. Um, so there's a little bit of just normal housekeeping on it. There's, it helps the stench of death. But it is actually an idea of they're tending to because they still love, they still honor, and even the dead have a dignity. And I find that intriguing that they were coming to give respect to the one they love, even though they thought he was dead. Because I think there's brokenness still in the world and things um, are probably pretty heavy and there are people and sometimes our own selves where we just feel like we're beyond what God can do. If we're dead inside, if, if the world is just this awful place and the Lord is calling out to each and every one of his creation to say, <laughs> you are not dead. The Lord is crying out to tend to those of us that were dead in our transgressions that he's coming to us and not just giving us respect, but actually breathing life into us. So you know what was happening is all of these doubts, they kind of trickle through those 40 days and we see it in scripture. And the whole time, you know what Jesus is doing? He's actually meeting with the disciples and he's breathing life into them. But there were people in Jerusalem who were saying, no way, not that guy. And the kingdom was actually still at work. He's breathing life into his disciples and his disciples are going to go and they're going to spread the, the good news. They're going to take the spirit and they're just going to let the spirit work and they're just going to go. And then they're going to experience God breathing new life into others. And then it's just going to keep expanding so that in 2024, the group of us can sit here on Thunderbird Road and hear the message that Jesus has life for us that he is breathing life into us. Regardless of how the week goes, what our circumstances is. And then on top of that, he's not just breathing life into us, but there's a broken world um, that others may leave abandoned by the side of the road. And they are people that Jesus cares for. And we get to be that light into the broken world. Whether the world acknowledges it or not, Jesus's work is at hand. That when he came out of that tomb, he is no longer dead, he is living. That we don't have to look for the dead, we actually get to experience the living Jesus in our world. So today, we actually celebrate um, because Jesus is not in the tomb. We actually celebrate because what the angels were actually saying is he hasn't stopped you felt like it. There was a moment. Makes sense. The last few days for Mary and the disciples were pretty rough. You felt like it was over, but it is not over. He is risen. And the story continues. You know, before Jesus was crucified, he gathered his disciples and he broke bread with them. And it was symbolic of what was about to happen. Um, which is he would become that sacrifice for us. And so in a minute, we're going to take communion together. And the idea is Jesus commands us to continue to do this. We've been doing this for a couple thousand years now. That we are brought to his table. 
And we remember the fact that he became the sacrifice for sin. And so we'll have a little piece of bread and, uh, and we'll break it. It's his body broken for us. And then we'll get a little bit of juice. And the idea is this is a symbol of the blood that he shed. And, and we do this, we come to his table in, in the holiness of what it is, but also knowing we're proclaiming that it happened, that he sacrificed for us. But we're also looking toward him coming again. And so he's, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. But I want us today to take it knowing he is risen. The symbol that we're taking is part of the story. But what we're looking for is the fulfillment of his kingdom, which is coming. Because nothing is going to stop it. If death cannot, nothing can stop his kingdom from coming because he is alive. I'm going to have the ushers come forward and uh, we will serve you so you can stay at your seats. And uh, we are going to um, have you just hold the elements until everybody has been served and then we'll take them together. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, and if you are gluten free, uh, Rory here in this beautiful white dress, she's going to walk down the aisles. Just oh, raise your hand and she will make sure that you get, come up here, honey, so they can see you. Come here, Rory. I know, you and I have this problem. You will grow, I will not. Rory has the gluten-free, so if you just raise your hand, she'll bring you the gluten-free. <laughs> Means you get the juice.
Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we come before you, and uh, we come before you knowing there's an ING in your plan, that you are living, that you are redeeming. And Jesus, um, as we come to your table, Lord, we want to ask that you forgive our sins. Uh, Lord, where we have failed you, uh, will you correct? And uh, Lord, where we have um, missed that mark, uh, where we have sinned against the holy things and, and one another, will you forgive us? Uh, and then, Lord, as you are bringing in your kingdom, uh, Jesus, we ask that as we take these elements, that you will fill us uh, that your spirit will be at work within us and that we will be sent by you uh, to be your light in a broken world. Uh, Lord, over these elements, we pray these common things become holy. And uh, Lord, will you be honored in what we do? We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. And on the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. And likewise, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he said, this cup is a new covenant of my blood, shed for the sins of many. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And he commanded to not only take and eat, but to remember that he's coming again. And so his kingdom is advancing, and we will see his kingdom coming in in perfection, but we actually get to participate in all that he's already doing and what he has for next week and the week after that and the week after that. I'm going to have our worship team come forward and we're going to close in a song of praise as we remember that he is risen, that his kingdom is continuing to advance. He is no longer in the tomb but he came out, not just victoriously, but in full awareness of who we are and what we need. Will you join us as we praise? Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wounds, His hands, His feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all. Oh, 
shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. My gaze is transfixed on Jesus' face. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore for endless days. We will sing Your praise, O Lord. Our God knows what he's doing. In fact, he was still, we just sang it, he was still Messiah in the tomb. We just didn't understand it, the depths that he had to go to. And so maybe this week, if the world is trying to tell you he's dead, you can return with, he is not there. He has risen. If, if at some point you're starting to, to doubt where, where is the Lord to go back to Luke and hear the angels say, you don't need to look for the, living, for the living among the dead. He is alive and active because forevermore his praises will reign. That his people will sing and he is calling after all of us. Will you join me as we pray? Jesus, we do praise your name, Lord, for the fact that you are a God who, um, who came and you dwelt among us. You walked our roads. Uh, Lord, you intersected our lives as we were. And Lord, you loved us enough to die for us. And so, Lord, as we go today, may we remember, uh, Lord, you're not in the tomb. You walked out and you continued this story. Lord, may we remember the story is still continuing and that we get to be part of it. And so, Lord, as we carry on, may those that feel lost, those that have not heard your name, hear you call after them by name. Lord, for those of us that um, are following and, and we're trying to figure out your direction for our lives, will your spirit continue to guide us? And then, Lord, may we all um, hear that chorus of praise that will be yours for all eternity. And we'll continue to exalt you above every other name. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you for joining us this morning. <clears throat>
sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, for your love is the end and I'm breathing. I have the future, my eyes are open, cause when you call my name. I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Jesus, who pulled me out of that pit? He did. 